The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at the talk Give me faith, trust what you say. on the talk station, Faith Matters. Hey, welcome to the program. Good to have you along with us here on Faith Matters. On the talk station, I'm Ben Ball, along with Reverend Robert Cornegy, Bishop Doc Loomis, and Reverend Mark Woods. And uh, good to have everybody here with us today. And uh, let's get started into the program. And the first article we're going to talk about is from the Politico. And it's um, from Politico magazine. It's how Kasich's religion is hurting him with conservatives. He might be the truest believer in the race and has come back to bite him, according to Laura Turner's article. The opening paragraph, the Republican nomination can sometimes seem like a contest to see which candidate is the most religious. Ted Cruz touts his born-again faith and he recalls how he surrendered his heart to Jesus as an eight-year-old at summer camp. Marco Rubio has in different times embraced Catholicism, Mormonism, and evangelicalism, says that his faith is the single greatest influence in his life. Uh, Donald Trump, by all appearances, has never attended church regularly and claims that he has never even asked God for forgiveness, but he nonetheless speaks about American Christians as though they're a persecuted minority and has earned the widespread support of evangelicals. There's a good reason to believe, however, that the most religiously driven candidate of all is a man who is remarkably untheatrical about his beliefs, who even vows, I don't go out and try to win a vote by using God. I think that cheapens God. That's John Kasich. Kasich won his first primary uh, since this was written, I believe. He won the um, uh, primary in Ohio where he's governor, so the favorite son moniker, and he was able to still, um, well, keep a little bit of a heartbeat, I guess, in his campaign. Uh, But they go on to say in this, uh, there's no easy way to measure how deeply a person believes, of course, and I think that is a crucial statement in making this. And that's Robert. No easy way. No easy way. Uh, He says, the irony here is not just that the most pious Republican candidate has been largely overshadowed in the campaign for which Christianity is a major calling card, as Kasich makes what could be his last big campaign push, he says. His devout faith might actually be hurting him. The governor's faith appears to drive his politically moderate stances on a number of things. So... um, um, uh, Bishop uh, Doc Loomis, you you had said that um, that uh, Kasich was a parishioner actually in one of your churches at one time. He was. He's a good Anglican guy from uh, Westerville, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Is where he attends church. It's mm-hmm. a rather small church, St. Augustine's, and he is by all accounts a model parishioner. Mm-hmm. So, have you um, uh, when he entered this race, did you have any thoughts about uh, where he you know, where his faith was forming him on and running, or? Uh, not really. I, I, I actually thought more about the magnificent job he'd done in the state of Ohio uh, in reversing some really negative financial trends, job trends, etc. And uh, the fact that he was a, a, a very strong Christian was certainly was, was helpful. Mm-hmm. I'm always happy when we find a Christian running for office. The challenge with Kasich is really very simple. We don't really want people who are living the Christian life. <laughs> mm-hmm. We actually we just want people that say the words. We want people that know. I mean, it's a media-driven, soundbite-filled thing. That we're, am I wrong? You're looking no, at me like I'm crazy. I, I think you're so right. That's what I. That's what I'm laughing at. I mean, I think that's the case. So here, here you get a guy like Kasich that says, uh, you know, that his con, his convi- that his convictions uh, is that eternal life changes our perspective on daily life and i'm going yes of course i would want somebody to govern with eternity in mind but that's not what people want people want somebody that say i received jesus when i was eight years old i've been washed in the blood they want to hear they want to hear the talk but they don't want to imagine that somebody's going to run or or think or live like a real come on this happens in our churches we love to hear the pastors say it but we hate it when somebody in the church does it yeah. Robert? <laughs> Not at Robert's church. Yeah, <laughs> Robert is the cynicism is deep I, today. I, I Grasshopper. Can't. I'm not going to be able to do this one. <laughs> yeah. I will be the only Mark's one unemployed it. after this. <laughs> 
Well, I, I, uh, the article is a fascinating article, and it really is. You know, considering the Politico has a political perspective on these things, and what I, I, my humble opinion, this article is what often happens in in the media. They try to build up one so that it takes emphasis away from others, and so this is part of that political ploy that agenda that's going on within the media and i'm, I'm getting lots of hand action in it's here right? <laughs> i'm so glad this is not televised because <laughs> none of us have the face for tv oh, anyway no. um yeah but Kasich. i, I mean i love his testimony I, I think it's a powerful testimony I, I think i'm glad he's in the race i i don't know much about i mean i know that he's done some great financial stuff and different things in in ohio but um you know he's he's not going to make it. It's just the numbers aren't with him. So um, it's it's uh, you know we need people with um, a a Christian worldview to run for politics. And so I commend him for being in the game and going for it. And I hope he'll I hope they'll hope he. When he gets back to Ohio, is he still going to be governor? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, good. Right. He needs to continue on. Although I think he does have ambitions beyond being the governor. Well, of Ohio this is it. Though. I mean, that's. I mean, well, whether or not he can. There do may this be again. other positions in a government yeah. that, if there is a Republican government. That um, he could serve in. I don't know. I don't know if he has those ambitions or not. Well, Mark, you have certainly enjoyed the first part of this uh, segment. Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm still on Doc's comments. Uh, you know, uh, I, there's something true, or there's something that I want to believe that Christianity would always hurt you politically. Like, there's something refreshing about that. I don't know what it is, but it, I mean, I'm just, I guess off the top of my head, I'm thinking Jesus, right? I'm thinking the disciples think he's going to come in, he's going to throw off Roman oppression, he's going to become king, right? He's going to become, you know, a first century king. Uh, and when that when that whole scene breaks out and he's standing there before Pilate, has, and, and he ends up losing uh, quite badly. He ends up being crucified, you know, and I just... There should always, and I, I always say this, but there should always be some kind of tension there between what is happening politically and where Christians find themselves in that. Um, and a politician who is a an active participant, or as uh, Bishop said here, a mm-hmm. model parishioner, um, there should be some there should be some serious tension there. There should be some. But some problems. I mean, just just to say it lightly. Are we just simply not uh, set? Well, this year, I mean, think, you have to throw a lot of rules out. I mean, obviously, with uh, with Donald Trump as I think as a, such a populist in the in the race, a lot of the rules have been thrown out about what about labels. Certainly, labels of conservatism, liberalism, Christian, non Christian. You know, all of these things are not necessarily applying in the race, and that's made Kasich and others struggle. With how to how to how to fight that how to how to get that populist strain without giving up their own values on that. Well, I like what Mark is saying. I, I completely, you know, the easiest way to point out the crookedness of a stick is to lay a straight stick next to it, and that's really what that's you know, if you're in politics and you're a Christian, you're a straight stick laying next to a crooked stick, and it becomes real clear. And in this country, the way the, where politics has gotten to now is we hold our nose and look and try to pretend like that stick isn't crooked, <laughs> like that's it's all right. But then you you take a John Kasich and you lay it down, you lay him down next to it, and it makes the politicos really uncomfortable to see how crooked politics is. That's a great point. That's a C.S. Lewis point that um, you know you don't know what the the real values, moral values, absolutes, those kind of things are until you have a standard and and God established the standard. And so, yeah, I uh, I really think he is a, a a quality candidate in a field that has uh, where he's not going to. There's no way he's going to rise to the top because where quantity the, is the yeah <laughs> the the the, um, the angst. That's in our in our population now. The fear, really. Mm-hmm. You know, he's coming from a different center than most people. Center of his life, 
and there's that's a, why people can't decide if he's a liberal or a conservative, right? A Democrat yeah. or a Republican. Yeah, there's right. there's a piece there that people, you know, that's the conflict, isn't it? Mm-hmm. People people are looking for somebody to, you know, take names and <laughs> kick some people around, and um, you know he's he's trying to bring in another flavor to that, and it's it's not. Sadly, it's not selling. (laughs) And what you do in the world shapes your identity, right? What you do. If you play baseball all day, every day, you're going to probably get pretty good at baseball, right? You're going to get, you're going to be able to do it. And it seems to me if Kasich is, you know, the model parishioner, Christianity forms and shapes you to think and to do things in the world in a particular way. I mean, it just it shapes who you are. And sometimes I think that Christianity shapes people in such a way that they would come at they would they would they would be at odds with our political system. And and even even democracy, even all of those things. They, there would be a rub there because they're being shaped by something else. If you are always in politics and you're always, you know, you're being shaped by that particular world, you know, view as Robert would call it, you know, you're going to you're gonna act in that way. And he's just he's shaped differently. We'll have more to come in just a moment here on Faith Matters on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. I'm Ben Ball, along with Reverend Robert Carnegie from Chapel by the Sea, Reverend Mark Woods from Cherry Point United Methodist Church, and also Bishop Doc Loomis from All Saints Anglican. Good to have you with us on Faith Matters on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with uh, Bishop Doc Loomis, uh, Reverend Mark Woods, and Reverend Robert Cornegy in this uh, second segment here on the program for today. We're taking a look at a, at a story that as we tape this on a Thursday, this is the being, uh, there is some breaking news about it. Originally, it was an article from uh, Christianity Today about do Christians face genocide from ISIS? U.S. House unanimously votes yes. And that was about a vote taken on Monday uh, by the House of Representatives. And then there was a wait for the State Department to recognize that and to agree with that and, and to declare that the actions by ISIS are indeed um, a genocide. Now, uh, we have to remember ISIS has gone by a number of different names, ISIL, ISIS, IS, and DASH, which I don't know what D-A-E-S-H stands for. Uh, but in any case, that is the name that uh, Secretary of State John Kerry is using in his declaration now. Uh, this news that came out for, on Thursday says uh, Secretary of State John Kerry declared this morning that his, in his view, the Islamic State, which is called Daesh or D-A-E-S-H, is committing genocide against Yazidis, Christians, and Shia Muslims. Language included in the omnibus spending bill passed by Congress and signed to the law by President Obama in December required Kerry to declare by today whether the Islamic State was committing genocide against Christians, Yazidis, and other religious minorities in the area it controls. What what it means uh, is in his statement a little bit later on. It means that as uh, more, uh, well, let me go back out. Let's see. We're preparing for future efforts to liberate occupied territory with an eye to the protection of minority communities, said Gary. In particular, the liberation of Mosul, of Nineveh province in Iraq, and parts of Syria that are currently occupied by Daesh. And then we'll decide if there's a future for minority communities in this part of the Middle East. What this means for the Secretary of State to go along with this and declare that is then any consulates or any any uh, any any of the ambassadorships under his control could report genocidal activities, which could lead to international court uh, functions. Um, I think Doc, you had brought up uh, if we were if we were looking at past ages, we would could look at a Nuremberg type tribunal. I don't think this quite fits that, but it's, there are other ones. I think there were there were efforts, for example, uh, with Cambodia uh, to to talk about genocide under Pol Pot. So. The, to bring this is one of those statements that a major power now helps to bring the world community in on this action. Um, and what about this as part of the fight or what this battle against ISIS? We we talk a lot about how this is a battle of of a group that has a 
theological foundation uh, that the apocalypse needs to come that the end times uh, they can they can bring it forward they can force it into action and uh, and and force uh, this this uh, resounding into the world and and what way they believe would come from that so is this something that is a matter for us both as Christians and and as members of the world community to fight well absolutely I think we're we're seeing the um, slaughter of the innocents I mean it's just just happening again and again and again, and and uh, it's it. Frankly, it's just amazing to me that it's taken our government this this much time to come around to this position. It's, you know, when when the uh, Knights of Columbus produces a report, <laughs> graphic report about all the atrocities that are taking place at Christians, and and uh, there were just four nuns were just killed in Yemen um, mm-hmm. over this. I mean, this isn't just in Syria and uh, Iraq. Iraq yeah. This is uh, spreading, and so uh, for a, for our um, Secretary of State to finally take a position on this, I think is uh, it's, it's way way late. But um, like you said, this can move things forward. I mean, there's no, you know, the uh, legislation le- legislative side of the eye of the of the government, the three branches, the legislature and the. The executive, they they unanimously approved this, and now Kerry has basically codified it mm-hmm. into the executive branch. So where that goes from here, we don't know. But um, like the, you know, hopefully there's going to be some action taken on this. I know there are already groups of of um, mercenary Christian mercenaries, if you will, what a oxymoron. But they're going over and um, and fighting with the Kurds and fighting with others to try to. Stop the slaughter of of uh, these um, non combatants. I mean, we're talking about non combatants here that are being um, persecuted, and, and particularly in the trafficking, human trafficking side of it. This is look. You don't have to be a Christian to be be a, for that. I mean, the, there are plenty of secular organizations that are fighting this human trafficking thing, and that's a lot of what's going on over there, the slavery side of it. So yeah, it's let's let's. I think the significant part of this, in terms of the statement, is is naming uh, at least three groups in this statement, including Christians, but you, the Yazidis and the Shias, as well as being ones who are persecuted uh, under this and and killed and and as they said, genocide, genocidal activity. So, is is this a? It, where do we stand as a, as faith communities, um, Bishop? I know that you look for ecumenical. Uh, outreach often in various ways is this perhaps one that actually can reach across religions and faiths to try to stop wow <clears throat> that's a good question uh, i was more worried about the baptists and presbyterians but um <laughs> yes i suppose it's interesting that because you mentioned in your uh your prologue here that we were doing uh that the, the word that carrie used was dash mm-hmm which is the is there, is, Iraq and the whole Levant, which is a, a large geographical area. And it's interesting that, the, uh, that ISIS uh, actually view that as one big geographical reality. And, so, and, and in that reality is, uh, is, is, is Jordan, uh, Israel, those, those are all in the Levant. And, uh, you know, we talk all the time about the persecution of the uh, Jews in Israel, and we've seen the ecumenical or the uh, cross-faith outreach that that we do in this country to the Jews. I don't like the idea that anybody is being killed by anybody, that their children are being abducted and sold as sex slaves to pay for their wars. I think every Christian person should be outraged at every life that's taken through uh, this this kind of this kind of war. This is not even a war. This kind of butchering uh, for profit. It's interesting. I'm looking at an article out of uh, the Mirror in the in the UK that says actually dash is the word that ISIS despises. Yeah, uh, and they threaten to cut out the tongues of anyone who uses it. So I, I find it interesting that the State Department would take that strong a stance. They've used ISIL in the past to speak of the Levant, as you said, a larger area than just Iraq and Syria. It is a um, and they've declared a nation. They've declared a state. Mm-hmm. So. Is genocide being perpetrated by a state enough to bring 
to bear the forces that will be necessary to stop it. Or they would say it, 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 they're a ca- caliphate, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, which is another, their word for, for uh, a nation. And uh, so, yeah, they've created an entity, over political, theological entity over there, a theocracy, if you will, um, that is, um, is, has, has a, a, an agenda. And their agenda is to remove, cleanse from their caliphate um, any of these groups, these three groups that have been identified. So, yeah, there, there is a, there, there's a real force there to be dealt with. Yeah. By the way, Dash is an acronym for the Arabic phrase that is the translation of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, mm-hmm. which would, again, they were using ISIL before that, the English acronym. Our so, state State Department. State was Department using, was using yeah. that. Our administration, yeah. So, uh, I, again, uh, Mark? Kind of quiet on this, yet you've got a lot of people who could potentially be on the front lines of any really on the ground battle against this group. Yeah. Um, that makes me a struggling pacifist Christian. <laughs> uh, and I think this is, this is one of those things where it's a struggle. Um, the liturgy uh, for Holy Communion and the Great Thanksgiving towards the end says, um, we look forward for toward a what does it say? When justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream, and neither shall they learn war anymore. Right. Sometimes for me, uh, as a pastor of you know uh, military, Marines and corpsmen, and Department of Defense, and uh, a lot of those guys, sometimes I, I just have to fall back on that kind of hope. Um, you know, and I really don't know where else to go. Because on one hand, I want all of the Marines that are in my church not to have jobs that they have. You know, I want them to all to not have to do this kind of thing, right? And I think it's, for me, pastorally, it is my job to hope that their job goes away. Um, (laughs) But on the other hand, I think Robert makes a good point that there is, there are innocents that are just that are being slaughtered mm-hmm. and and you know some Christians can take an, a, a sort of Augustinian position from the from St Augustine and say you know that we have some kind of duty to to protect the just those war. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think this is this is tough and I think that the statement that John Kerry made moves us closer to action I think that that's precisely why they would talk about genocide, why he would use Daesh instead of ISIL or ISIS. I think it moves us closer to action. Uh, and so maybe there is a time when we sell our purse and sell our bag and, and buy, buy a, sword. a sword. Well, and there's also there's two, there's two points in Scripture that one of them says, take your, your swords and, 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 you know. Beat them in the plowshares. Beat them in the plowshares. But then in Job, it also says the opposite. Take your plowshares and beat them into swords, you know. Um, I think that we, we have a conflicting view, and in Christianity, this, sh- this should not be an easy thing to just say, let's go, mm-hmm. let's fight. It should never be that easy Last for us. resort. Mm-hmm. More to come in a moment on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240, and I'm Ben Ball, along with Reverend Mark Woods, Reverend Robert Carnegie, and Bishop Doc Loomis, and we'll have more to come in a moment. back on Faith Matters here on the talk station FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball along with uh, Reverend uh, uh, Mark Woods and also Reverend Robert Cornegie and Bishop Doc Loomis. And I was I forgot where I was going to go there for a second. That's all right. That's all right. It works. Brain cloud. Yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about an article that's uh, come up. And it's not the first time this controversy has arisen. But this is from the Seattle Times. Bishop opposes Notre Dame's decision to give medal to Biden. And from South Bend, Indiana, the AP story here, actually, the University of Notre Dame should not award Vice President Joe Biden its top award because it sends a message that a politician can support abortion rights and gay marriage and still be a good Catholic, the Bishop of Fort Wayne South Bend Diocese says. Uh, Notre Dame announced March 5th that it would award the La Latar 
Is that how you say it? A tar medal to a Biden and former Speaker of the House John Boehner for their leadership, civility, and dedication to the nation. The Reverend John Jenkins, the Catholic University's president, said at the time that the university was not endorsing the public positions of either man. In a statement released Monday, Bishop Kevin Rhodes said that while he understand the school's effort to recognize Catholics from different political parties, Biden's early and vocal support for same-sex marriage and his backing of abortion rights does not sit well with the teachings of the Catholic Church. Um, I, I kind of look at this as uh, this is Notre Dame. I mean, this is a, a, a university that, that may, we might consider to be one, one of the last of the big universities founded uh, on a religious uh, basis that may still care about that. And, um, uh, and I, I don't say that lightly uh, because I think that's, we've seen that b- borne out in time and time again in other schools. Uh, Doc, you did a little work there at um, at Notre Dame, familiar with the culture there a little bit. Is this out of character with uh, the culture of Notre Dame? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and then elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's been it's been uh, thirty five, almost forty years mm-hmm. since I had any relationship with the school, but it certainly would not. This would not have flown at that time. Mm-hmm. But uh, the uh, Latari medal that they're giving out is, is something they've done for a long time, obviously. And it is, it's designed just like doctoral degree, honorary doctorates and other things are designed to do to bring a person of the faith who has made a significant contribution to society, the honor that he or she is due. And the challenge that's come up this time, as you, as the author has rightly noted is, you know, how do we honor somebody who's made a significant contribution, but who's but who has made that contribution in trying to tear apart and destroy the very things that the university or that Catholicism is, uh, is, is standing for. And I actually agree with the bishop in this case. I think this is a horrible move for this university right now because it, it compromises the faith once delivered. This is a real challenge for the university. It was a challenge when, they, if you remember, this is the group that gave President Obama the uh, honorary doctorate. To, yeah. It's it's a huge challenge. It sends really uh, uh, it sends a significantly mixed message to a student that that if you grew up from this university and you listen to our teaching and then you go out and decide it's okay to murder babies, then that's fine. Wow, are you serious? Is that really what a, a religious based institution wants to teach their students? It's bad. It's bad. Bad message. Uh, in reference to what you mentioned, in 2009, Harvard University law professor, anti-abortion scholar Marianne Glendon, also a former U.S. ambassador to the Vatican, announced that she wouldn't accept the medal uh, because of the university's decision to have President Barack Obama speak at commencement. So, uh, Robert, you often say that ideas have consequences here, too. Is this is their, their idea is to promote civility? Uh, it seems like it's <laughs> becoming uncivil. Well, every everything has parameters, doesn't it? I mean, it used to be that way. That there were there were boundaries, and so you tr- you tried to work within the boundary. We're talking about sacraments of the Holy Roman Church that um, mm-hmm. have been violated by a practicing Catholic. Now he is a vice president. And he has served as a senator, and in many, many, many ways for many, many years. And um, there is honor due him in his service. In but as you know, I'm not familiar with with all the background on this, but I do agree that this is just a terrible decision. Uh, I think by the by the school to do this. Look, Harvard. What was Harvard founded? What was the purpose behind the mm-hmm. founding of Harvard, of Princeton? Of Yale to produce preachers to produce preachers <laughs> to I mean to be sending out mm-hmm. ambassadors of Christ representing the kingdom of God on earth and here you know so that's on this side of it now the 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 Roman Catholic education system is is um, capitulating mm-hmm. it's a capitulation as far as I'm concerned of their of their what it means to be a a good Catholic. Mark, a divinity degree from Duke University. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, to preface that. Yeah, that way. right, right. Um, well, l- let me use formerly it. Formerly Trinity University, by the way. That's right, Trinity formerly College. Trinity University. Um, well, let me use my degree then. Uh, Latare in Latin means rejoice. Mm. 
Uh, so this is the sort of rejoice um, metal, if you will. Re- rejoice Jerusalem, right? Just rejoice Jerusalem, that's right, from Latari that. Sunday. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. Um, and you know, I don't know. Part of what the metal is for, the article says what the, ar- what the uh, metal is for, and it says it, it honors every year, it's given every year to a Catholic whose genius has eno- ennobled the arts and sciences, illustrated the ideals of the church, and enriched the heritage of humanity. Um, and I think that the rub is there. Number uh, two. Illustrated the <laughs> ideals three. of and the church. Three. And, three. and maybe for some, the rub is enriched the heritage of humanity. Um, yeah, I think anytime. And, and, you know, I guess you said that Notre Dame was the kind of the last big university that's claiming Catholicism in a, in, in a, in a powerful way. Well, there are, in Catholicism, there are smaller universities that were established because Notre Dame had become right. not Catholic enough or that they were moving to- more towards a sort of liberal arts college and not really being Catholic. I'm thinking of Ave Maria down in Naples, which is a little bit way more conservative um, Catholic University down there. Um, Dominican it, in Ohio. That's right. The Dominicans in Ohio, possibly in Washington as well. So, Surprising enough, I'd say that about the Dominican House in Washington, but, um, you know, that are a little bit more conservative. And so, you know, I think that Notre Dame has been for some time, maybe, and, and Doc might be able to, to, to speak more to this, but has been struggling with that identity. How do we remain, you know... Uh, a, maybe not struggling, though. Maybe embracing it. Right. Maybe embracing kind of this is what we're going to be. We're going to be a more moderate, the you know, a more moderate Catholic uh, university. And they're going and, and so they're gonna get they're gonna get this this sort of blowback from those who say, you know, you can't give the Latari medal to someone who is supporting something that the Catholics work very hard against. And so I mean I think I think that the bishop has a I mean, mm-hmm. it has an argument here. Well, while Doc, you said it was um, 40 years ago for you, there's still there's all alumni that'll be in that class as well that, that were there a long time ago. And I wonder how this is this sort of sets with them. I really, I really don't know. There hasn't, there's not a lot been written about it from an alumni perspective. I did look before we came in today just to see if there was, mm-hmm. you know, an alumni group or something that had formed and was standing against us i I really didn't i really didn't see that um so i i think you know that the youth doesn't affect the football team (laughs) i'm so glad you said that for me that's being the biggest notre dame fan in carteret county i just want to say (laughs) that you know as long as they keep winning football yeah that's right (laughs) Well, I mean, maybe they I need to start that, again, though. But that would be we we subject. we joke about no, that. no, don't joke. Catholics are awesome football players. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing. I'm not going to say on that. Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. 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 All right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> no, but I think there's something to be said for that when it comes to sports and things. When a university's when a university's model shifts to something else, whether it's economics of sports, whether it's economics of a particular program, it's going to shift everything, right? It's it, the. Mm-hmm. I, I think that consequences give us ideas as well. Once something happens, it, it changes our ideas of certain things. So, I mean, possibly you could talk about any university, Duke, for instance. Sure. Brigham Young. Brigham Young. Yeah, right. Once you switch to see that, oh, man, sports can, mm-hmm. can do a lot for a university, um, you know, it might change what is the what is the governing principle, if you will, or I, or idea. But don't 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 they believe that God is on the side of the football team still? I mean, <laughs> well, they yeah. got a special in. I mean, obviously that's, that's part of. We the, got touchdown Jesus. Baby. <laughs> that's right. Nobody else has Jesus with his hands up over their stadium. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's uh, it, this isn't the first time though. It's come up about no. a Catholic in Congress uh, and and trying to to uh, whether hold them accountable for their faith position as well. To I mean, Nancy Pelosi is in that uh, in that vein as well as uh, Joe Biden and others. I mean, it's come several times about withholding communion mm-hmm. from them. It's been said mm-hmm. because of their positions. Mm-hmm. No, I think this Bishop Wood sure. sounds like it. This is this is the upside down story of the Kasich story, isn't it? It is just I mean, the opposite. If you, if you, if, if, for those of you that woke up and were with us at the eight o'clock hour when we started this, this is the upside down version. This is you know it's hurting Kasich politically that he's living out his faith, 
And then here's this bishop saying that that people should live out their faith. Right. right. Yeah, it's upside it, down. It should and, affect their politics. And it shouldn't be rewarded uh, for mm-hmm. not doing that. They can yeah. be rewarded, just maybe not with the Latari. That particular yeah, yeah, reward. Or at Notre fine. Dame. Or at Notre Dame. Again, again, honoring, as you said, uh, his uh, Joe Biden for his service to the country. Whether we agree with his positions or not, anybody who is willing to put themselves out and, and serve uh, for their country for some time is is to be honored for that. I mean, we that's where we're in the that's where in the marketplace of ideas that that will counter that. But, but uh, all this stuff opinions, comes, it but. just comes down to those one liners. You know, literally, they're going to pin the medal on the chest of a man who's in favor of killing babies in the womb. I'm sorry, man. That is <laughs> that is a challenge. I can't get past that. Right. I don't care what he's done for this country. Mm-hmm. I just can't get past that as a Christian. We'll have more to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the Talk Station FM 107 and AM 1240. Hey, welcome back here on Faith Matters on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240 for our final segment together. And this one is a little different. This is from a, uh, this is taken from the Bellingham Herald, which is, I think, the local paper for this particular um, Longview, Washington, where it's coming out of. Uh, Should Longview Church remove swastika floor tiles? It's the headline here, and I was just attracted immediately when I saw that headline. It says, uh, when R.A. Long established Longview Community Church in the 1920s, he wanted it to be a truly community church welcoming people from all Christian traditions. When visitors step in, though, they encounter a symbol that people now associate with terror, though it was once a revered sign for several faiths. About 60 floor tiles emblazoned with the swastika-style crosses are interspersed with red tiles in the church's narthex or entrance. Some folks wander in and ask, is is this a swastika church? (laughs) Pastor John Williams said, about once a year, someone paints swastika graffiti on the church's exterior. Well, now... They've been there for about 90 years, but now their recent remodeling project put the congregation at odds about keeping said tiles there. Uh, first of all, it's it's obvious in the 1920s, whoever put this in was not, or I don't think, had that idea in mind. Mainly it's was an, not a it's, Nazi sympathizer. No. Yeah, it's, an, it's inverted. Well, it's, it was before the, that was even a symbol. Yeah. Them. So, um, And it's also inverted from what the Nazis used. But it's still that same kind of iconic shape that we all can look at and, and recognize it. Uh, so, so what do you think? Should this be a concern for a Christian community that people will have a mistaken idea about what they may stand for because of a tile in their church? Well, let's put it in context. First of all, it's, it's, it's the narthex of the church. It's the entrance to the church. Mm-hmm. And there are several different historic representations of the cross as it's been seen throughout Christianity. And the Philfot cross, the backwards swastika or vice versa, Inver- is inverted, yeah. just one of those it's just one of those symbols that happens to be in the floor. And you know, I gosh, I, I would hate you know, I don't want people to have to you know, I, I hate when people have to, you know, drive down my street and look at my neighbor who's got the the uh the rebel flag hanging there and I, I would hate that he would feel bad about that. But this is really just bad education. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is the, the thing that concerns me more about it is that it's that, uh, as the article points out, the uh, this particular cross is a, is is a, is a, a holy icon in Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Jainism, Odinism. Uh, it actually has more to do with those faiths than it ever did historically with Christianity. It was an interesting choice. Yeah. So. So, so was it a purposeful choice then to put Absolutely. it there? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. yeah, no question. Okay. Yeah, it's one of the historic crosses that the church has uh, has, has since been. abandoned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Yes. Wisely, it like that. Yeah. It's wisely yeah. abandoned. Yeah. Yes. But um, you know, Hitler chose it because of its Aryan mm-hmm. background. You know, the Indian um, subcontinent, Indian. Um, position on that and so that was why he chose it. and then he changed it modified it 
mm-hmm. from its original configuration. So uh, there are different symbols, but when you the, the I'm holding the picture up to the microphone, yeah, so right? You so can see this. <laughs> and uh, it's yeah. it's it's just reversed mm-hmm. of of what we're accustomed to. But still, the first thing you see mm-hmm. is that broken cross. You know, right. Does yeah. this, but does this rise? Here's, I think, the question that I think the congregation is struggling with, even if they're not going to these passages. But does it struggle? Does it rise to the point of being a stumbling block to somebody's faith? Just to to be to see this, Mark, you haven't chimed in yet on this. What do you think? <laughs> Except to say that it's a abandoned. Symbol. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, is that a if consideration? You're known as the swastika church. <laughs> no, that's not. I mean, like we're in a time where branding is really a a, a, a crazy thing, right? I, I'm not a huge fan, but a lot of churches want to brand, and so they've changed their. I mean, some churches have changed their name to not even say church; they're just like fire hydrant, or yeah, the point flame, <laughs> yeah, or you know. And we don't even want to say church, but if you're known in the community the community as the swastika church. You know that's you know that there there needs to be some education there. You yeah. know there needs to be. Well, some they're education. they're concerned about the people that are what, coming. You know in what I would do? This is what right? I would encourage my people to do, and I'll just go out there and throw my cards out there. I'd say let's remodel, let's pull up those bricks. We will have a case of you know like a like a china there case, and I would put a couple of those bricks in there with a little note by it says. I mean, kind of like the Confederate this, flag over South Carolina. We're exactly, take it down and but put just it into to say, look, this is part of our history. There are there are Methodist churches yeah. that were um, Methodist uh, uh, South South churches, right? Yes. They were the Methodist Episcopal school South. That, thank you, and we and they split. And and if you go to, I know Mount Olive United Methodist Church is just like this, and they have cases all around where they put these historical artifacts. Well, this is when we were uh, more of a segregated church, you know, and this was our hymnal. We didn't use the Methodist hymnal; we used this hymnal, you know. It was the Southern hymnal, and it, and it, and it kind of gives the people in a sort of historical identity. So, I mean, you could do. I would probably encourage my people to do something like that. Let's just say let. What a what a wonderful story to tell that when this was built it was the file the the file fought cross and now you know after the 30s it became something a little bit is it, that's how you say it right filifot filifot sorry um, you know latari metal and yeah <laughs> latari metal that's right I All got right. that one right <laughs> you didn't got I? It. okay yeah. um, I messed that one up but um and then you know they could see wow this is part of our history it's not really a swastika. You know, I think that's what I would encourage them because that would encourage the education of what it is instead of having a floor mm. full. Of we it. are going through the exact same thing at our church right now. I don't know if you're aware of this. No, there about half of the people in Carteret County think that All Saints Anglican Church is the All Saints Angelican Church, <laughs> and we're actually thinking about adopting that name because it sounds so good. <laughs> Angelican. <laughs> yes, most most of our mail comes addressed to the Angelican Church. <laughs> a bunch of angels. Yes, and it, yeah, and it, I like wow. it. Yeah. I like that too. Isn't it weird that we 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 freak out over this symbol, this ancient symbol in the floor, and yet up on the wall above the uh, altar is this gigantic execution symbol. Yeah, that's right. The cross that people yeah. were were crucified on. I mean, you know. Well, and, but what's funny is a lot of churches are taking that down because well, it's that's offensive. True. It's that's offensive, true. so they're taking. Yeah, it right. That won't be yeah. one I go to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's well, see, case. we had this. Uh, uh, let me go back to a college thing at William and Mary. They had the uh, a big controversy over removing the cross from the chapel at William and Mary because it was used for a, a, a multiple faith. Mm-hmm. It was used for a number of things. So that was a, yeah. that was a big issue. Uh, you know, that might be a little different than this. But, yeah. I mean, yeah. but it's you know, I think the but, the, the, the question in the in the article, the last question, was sort of what the what the people are having to deal with. And the last question just simply says, how do we protect history but make sure we are lasting into history? I think it is I think it's a historical question for them. Yeah, I, mean, right. I I like your idea the idea you threw out, which would be to have strategically placed throw rugs available. <laughs> I said so, that. Yeah. I said that. <laughs> yeah. Depending on who was coming and what what event they were having. That's right. If the bishop's showing up, yeah, you throw you, the throw rugs. You throw those rugs <laughs> out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Well, you can see where our last segment often goes here <laughs> That's on right. the program. That's uh, but right. but that, I go back to my point, though, about being a stumbling block. I don't see it. I mean, I don't see that no. as being one. But there may be some people who will say, well, I'm, I'm not stepping foot into that church. Well, and, and it may attract a, and, and, a- a group that you may not be prepared to. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even think that. Yeah, right. well, you oh, know, no. you got the flip side of that as well. So, oh my, you have to be a little careful with that one. But it's a great um, evangelism opportunity either way. Yeah. But but you also bring up a point, Mark, about recognizing our history uh-huh. because we do all our churches. Well, church Christianity has in its history plenty of blemishes. Do we oh, yeah. shove them under the rug, or well, do we, it. or do we, do we bring them out and talk about them and have them in the open? And that's a, I think yeah, that's. I, that's well, a I question. like where Mark started this. I mean, the article says, after a while, perception becomes a reality, and if you are known in a community as the swastika church, that is probably just not a good thing. Mm-hmm. I just I hate to laugh. Angelican <laughs> on the other side is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Angelican, <yeah. laughs> absolutely. Maybe you could replace it with some angel tiles. <laughs> Well, this is going to be, uh, I think, uh, as, as they still are, are arguing over this, they're planning on the, doing this remodel. And it is, any time, as you, we probably have all done this, go through a remodel. We're about to come up on our 10th anniversary of our sanctuary. Uh, and so any time you have that, you have struggles. Any, you can look oh, at any yeah. kind of building yeah. project. Um, Robert, you just went through it, too. Oh, we replace pews with chairs. Ooh. Uh, ooh. 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 That's for another segment. Yeah, that was yeah, that, that could be his whole segment on its own there. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anytime you go through that, you certainly have those, uh, those decisions that have to be made that are going to ruffle feathers mm-hmm. one way or another. Yeah. So, and I would have loved to have seen, I probably should look it up, like pictures that are more contextual, right? The only picture you got on the article was just the symbol, right? And, and But then the other picture was the very front of the church. I'd like to see the whole church and see how those tiles are contextualized within the greater church. I think that probably would, would add a dynamic. Road to, trip. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Faith Matters road trip to Bellingham, we broadcast Washington. from that cathedral. From Bellingham. We could from next there, week. From, from that floor, from that narthex, <laughs> uh, with our feet on, on the tiles. <laughs> I'm not touching those tiles. Yeah. Uh, in, in any case, uh, it is one that we we consider when we look at our history. What do we preserve and what do we not? Uh, so thanks for joining us once again. Uh, I'm Ben Ball along with the Reverend Robert Cornegie, Reverend Mark Woods, and Bishop Doc Loomis here on Faith Matters on the Talk Station. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at the talkstation.com. of the talk station.